Thank you all. It's a little daunting, actually, to um, follow <laughs> these lectures. I, it's hard to so imagine what I'm going to say that's going to be more amusing than the uh, stories of pigeons and so forth. Um, but uh, for those of you, particularly those of you on Zoom who aren't here, let me just say that uh, there are there's two ways to do these lectures. Um, some people give a final technical lecture. I thought I've given hundreds of technical lectures. I'm going to take the other path, which is I'm going to think about uh, my career and perhaps talk about my career and the path of my career as opposed to uh, just focusing exclusively on the technical parts. So there is going to be some technical stuff. I, those of you who are not computer scientists, just hold your breath. Uh, we'll get past that. Okay, so the, the short answer to the question how I got here and how most of the computer scientists and uh, got here to EPFL and everywhere else is Moore's Law. And those of you who are in our field have seen this kind of curve a million times. Those of you who haven't seen it before, this is graphing the performance of sort of computers over... Well, down at the bottom, I have my career starting in the university and then PhD and then my career there. Um, it's a logarithmic scale, which means that every increment there is a factor of 10. So we have actually have a tremendous increase over the, the, scale, the graph. Um, one way to look at it is the box over here, which is that for a long time, every other year, we had twice as many transistors and we could run them twice as fast, which meant that computers got faster, they got cheaper, and they got more capable. I'm a software guy, not a hardware guy, but you know, computers running twice as fast is fantastic for software. You basically have this, you know, you can write software that runs too slowly and you don't really have to fix it because in two years there's gonna be a computer that's fast enough to run it. And this is pretty much my career and a lot of people's career. Um, I looked at it and since I got started 40 years ago or so, um, there's been about a 50,000 time increase in the performance of computers. And that's really what has driven a lot of the changes. And the changes I would call revolutions. And there have been four of them in my career. The first at the beginning was personal computing. Before that, we had big shared mainframe computers that were hard to use, we then moved to desktop computers. Those of you who are a little older probably remember the PC and the uh, Macintosh. Um, the next was the World Wide Web, which came from uh, just down the road here. And then mobile computing, which took the computer from the desk and put it in your pocket. And then finally, the one that we've just started a couple years ago, which is AI, where we don't really know where it's going to end up, but it's clearly in the next revolution, which is going to change things as dramatically as the previous three. So let me go back a little bit and start at the beginning. So I was born in 1958. Um, at that time, IBM was starting to sell a computer, uh, the 7090, which was their first transistor computer. Before that, they used vacuum tubes, which were terrible. Um, it sold for almost $3 million at that time, which is about $21 million today. So it was enormously expensive, and as a consequence, they didn't sell very many of them. A thousand computers were sold in 1957. And it wasn't very fast. Um, it could do 100,000 additions per second, which sounds terrible today. We do hundreds of millions or billions of additions per second. But it was a lot faster than the alternative, which was a room full of clerks with adding machines. A um, couple other things to note. Uh, notice everybody there is dressed the same way I am. You had to wear a suit and tie to use computers back then. Um, the other thing is that the gender balance was about the same as it is now, about 20% women. Um, we haven't really made much progress, unfortunately. Um, when I got to secondary school, computers got smaller, and this was what was called a mini computer, a PDP-8. My school had one. I was very fortunate to actually be able to do it because it's a very tangible expression of a computer. You know, you have switches and you have lights and you really, it really feels like a computer. When I think of a computer, I still think of switches and lights. Um, 
And it was a lot cheaper, right? I mean, it sold for $12,000, $13,000, which is only $80,000. I mean, right, what a deal. But you sold a lot more of them. And it was faster. I mean, it was three and a half, uh, three, and a th well, three times faster, um, which is pretty amazing considering the price was a fraction of it. And the other thing, for those of you who are sort of computer scientists, it was really simple, right? It had about 500 gates in it, which is a homework exercise for our students in a logic design class today. We could ask them to design this computer, and they could. But we ran a four-user time-sharing system on it, had 12K of memory, and we could actually get useful work done on it. So last one. Um, my PhD was the sort of, on the first thing was a Sun One, which was a desktop workstation with a microprocessor in it. It sold for $9,000, which is about half of my graduate student stipend, if I remember correctly. Um, so. It had a lot of memory. You know, we had a rich project, so we shared 600 megabytes of disk space. Things were different back then. But it looked like a computer today. It ran Unix. It had a Windows system. All of you would be uh, reasonably comfortable on it, even if you thought it was kind of strange and slow. Um, but you know, let's compare it to something tangible, like my watch. So you know, there's an Apple Watch. It has a processor that's, oh, 50 times faster. It has, you know, well more memory than it had before, 64 times more memory, uh, more flat, more storage, and it sells for $400. So all I could say is that my PhD research would have been a lot faster if I had used my watch than if I'd used <laughs> this computer. So this is sort of you know, the kind of progress that I've seen throughout my career, sort of steady st improvement in the underlying facilities of it. But that doesn't really explain how I got to computer science. Um, I really sort of want to blame these three books. Um, this is a computer architecture book, which probably most of you have never seen, but it's a very interesting book that talks about the early generations of computers, almost like they're biological. Um, because they were all one-offs, very different, very strange computers. But it fascinated me when I found it on the library shelves when I was in high school. And I was wondering, like, how does a computer work? And this told you more than you ever wanted to know. So uh, when I was programming the PDP-8, I was wondering, how does a deterministic machine generate random numbers? And so I asked one of my teachers, and he said, I don't really know, but there's this guy, Knuth, who wrote a book. And he has a lot of information about random numbers, and he does. He has about 200 pages about generating random numbers, and so I bought one of those books. And I realized that there is actually mathematics and science behind computer science, that there's really some depth to it. And then finally, the last one over here, the Dragon Book, which is really what it's, most people call it, um, is a book about compilers, which I found in college when I was taking a compiler class, and I was totally fascinated by it. The idea that you could write a program that would translate a program that you wrote into something that a machine could understand and it could make it run faster. And so this is where my career got started, actually doing compilers and programming languages. So, you know, from my undergraduate at Harvard, I went to Berkeley as a student, and I got very interested in uh, computer architecture and, and studying uh, of, because of this first person on this, Dave Patterson, who was a professor at the time, a new professor at Berkeley, who had just come up with this idea called reduced instruction set computing, risk computing, which was that you make the computer simpler and you can make it run faster. And Dave had a sort of great style for doing things. So, you know, one of the comparisons he had, you know, this is obviously his risk processor. You can see it's the uh, Porsche, and it's much faster than the comparison with the old compute car with the uh, tail fins. So Dave had great marketing. He uh, ran great projects, and I joined one of them, which was the Spur project at Berkeley. So this is not a famous Patterson project. Some of his have had tremendous impact, risk, and RAID are the two biggest, obviously. But this was the first real Patterson project in the sense of a project that influenced 
how we do computer science research, not only at Berkeley, but pretty much everywhere in the United States and in Europe as well. So it was a full system project. We did the chips, which are up there in that uh, Lucite tombstone. It took three chips to produce a computer at the time. We actually built the chips, we fabricated them, we connected them and ran them. We wrote an operating system, we wrote the programming languages on it, and we did the research on it. So it was really interdisciplinary. It was a lot of fun to work with people from other areas of computer science and actually electrical engineering as well. And there was considerable industrial participation and funding in this project. And we actually built a multiprocessor desktop workstation only 20 years ahead of Intel when they finally discovered that you wanted parallel processing on your desktop. We were, were there. And you know, it was one of the defense-funded projects in one of the AI summers. We were competing with the Japanese who had decided that logic programming was the way to do AI. It wasn't, uh, we, we, we weren't the way to do AI either, but it was a great project. And it was a great deal of fun being a grad student at Berkeley on one of these projects. Um, you know, I'd like to tell my grad students, this is the best job I ever had. And they all look extremely pained when I say that because they think like, oh my God, my life is going to be worse for the, for the rest of it. It's going to keep on going downhill. But, you know, we had retreats up in Tahoe in the mountains. Um, I had a lot more hair back then, you'll notice. Um, and you can see we actually had a, a working system. And many of these people went on to sort of illustrious careers in uh, our field. So my PhD research was on a truly bad idea. Uh, I'll, I'll be first to admit it. Um, it was on parallelizing Lisp code, which is to say taking code that was written for a conventional processor and transforming it so that it ran on a parallel computer with multiple uh, control units. And at the time, this was considered to be the only way in which people were going to program parallel machines. You, you would never get people to rewrite their programs, so a compiler had to do it. It never worked, it, it, either for Lisp or for Fortran or any other language, but at the time, this was considered to be the right way of doing it. And it was a very difficult problem because Lisp is a dynamic, imperative language. You know, the functional programming style, which would have made it easier, was only just emerging in the 80s when I was doing my work. Um, it required uh, pushing the state of the art in pointer analysis because Lisp was extremely pointer intensive. Um, as part of you know, Patterson projects, you always paid a project tax. You had to contribute to the project as a whole, not just do your own work. And so I ended up writing the compiler for the Lisp system, which was turned out to be a lot of fun, but um, it was part of being on the team on the project. Oops, wrong direction. So uh, takeaways, um, Dave Patterson advice that I've never forgotten. So aim your research where technology is headed, not where it's been. Seems obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people don't do this and sort of look back when they're trying to decide what to do next. Um, Dave was big on teams and projects, and he uh, had this uh, slogan, you know, there's no losers on a winning team and no winners on a losing team. And so he really had this you know, notion that we were part of Spur and not just working on our own PhDs. He was always very generous with, with credit, uh, authorship credit. We had extremely long authorship lifts because a lot of people worked on the project. And the other thing I really took away is that the result of an academic project is people, not just papers. You know, Dave was always sort of like, you know, my, my real sort of result of this thing is all of you, not just the papers that we produced in there. And I think that's true. I found I liked these ambitious, multi interdisciplinary projects, and pretty much this is what I've done for my entire career. Every time I've started a project, it's been in this mold. Um, I like building real systems. I like the prototyping and the demonstration, the, the sort of hard work to actually make them work, I didn't like as much, so I didn't really think of heading to industry and building products. And I finally learned I'm not a computer architect. Um, for those of you who go on the Spur project, you know, you know that the truly bad idea in the project was a 40-bit word with an 8-bit tag. That was my idea, not a good one. So after that, headed off to Madison, Wisconsin as a professor. You know, there's 
picture Madison, and there's the computer science building in Madison, um, where I continued some of my research and started some new research there. So I worked on sort of three broad areas, computer architecture, program instrumentation and measurement, and compilers and parallel programming. Um, in computer architecture, uh, along with two of my uh, uh, friends from Berkeley who came from the SPUR project and went to Wisconsin as professors at the same time, Mark Hill and David Wood, we started uh, the Wisconsin Wind Tunnel, WWT, which was a big DARPA-funded project to simulate parallel computers on a parallel computer. And the advantage of this is that you using a parallel computer, we could simulate much bigger, more complicated systems than you could simulate on the workstation on your desk. So we could explore these machines before you built them much more easily. Um, the other thing that's really sort of continued for a long time is that I wrote a simulator for a compiler class that I was teaching so the students could compile for a very simple, clean machine, the MIPS machine. And I, it ended up supporting this piece of software for 33 years. I'm still fixing bugs in it. Um, I've learned a lot of humility <laughs> from that, that you never really get rid of the last bug. You think it's working. You think, like, how can anybody find any bugs? You know, thousands of students have been using it every semester for 33 years. Guess what? There are still bugs. <laughs> Um, one of the things I enjoyed doing with the wind tunnel was pushing in this very interesting direction of customized cache coherence protocols. Cache coherence protocols are the way in which computers and a parallel computer talk to each other. And by customizing them, you can make them run more efficiently. And we had this unique tool, the Wisconsin wind tunnel, so we could do experimentation. The most important thing, though, is actually the last uh, point, which is that I started exploring how you verified these uh, protocols using a tool called Murphy, which was a model checker from Stanford. And this had a tremendous impact on my subsequent uh, stage of my career at Microsoft, which I'll talk to. Um, another thing I did at Wisconsin was uh, program measurement and instrumentation. And this is one of those fields I just stumbled into. I was sitting in a lecture and somebody was talking about tracing programs to generate address traces to do cache simulation, I think was it. And I thought, like, that's a silly way of tracing it. That's very inefficient. I could do much better. And I could do much better, which led to some papers on optimal techniques for profiling and tracing programs and building a tool for binary instrumentation and many, many applications of this as well. Um, and, of course, compilers and parallel programming wasn't uh, sort of far from the... The, the background, I kept on working on this with my students. We worked on a lot of parallel programming for non-numeric applications. There was a lot of work on Fortran and scientific high-performance computing, but there was less work on non-numeric applications like I had worked on for my dissertation, so we kept on doing that. Um, we focused on shared memory and really missed the big trend in the 90s, which was clusters of machines, which turned out to be the building block of the Internet. You can't win them all, I guess. <laughs> um, and in looking back at my papers, I was actually quite amused to sort of see this one. This is my third most cited papers after two sort of very high-profile papers. And this was a sort of quick uh, exercise that I did with one of my students in Ras Bodek, who was my successor at Wisconsin. We wrote one paper on the subject. We never really gave it another thought. It started an entire field of software engineering. Um, and sometimes these things happen. You just sort of, you have no intention, and it just sort of people pick up on what you've done. So one of the things I'll say is Wisconsin, I had great colleagues. There's Mark Hill and David Wood, who I work with at Berkeley and came into Wisconsin. And then my colleagues in programming languages, Tom Rapp, Susan Horowitz, and Charlie Fisher, all of whom were incredibly supportive and sort of helped me get started as a professor and, and uh, do this research. A couple of takeaways. You know, one of the things I learned is you encourage your junior colleagues, even if you like, couldn't imagine doing their research. Like, Tom Reps was a great programming language researcher, very formal guy. Never understood why I was fiddling around with binaries and programs until 10 years later when he and one of his students wrote a very nice paper about doing the analysis necessary for binary modification. Um, let your grad students follow their interests. Uh, my best grad student, Tom Ball, 
was actually Susan Horwitz's student. He wandered into my office one day and said, you know, I think I have a better way of doing program profiling than what you've been doing. And we wrote a paper, and that turned into a couple of papers, and that turned into his dissertation. So it's uh, there. Bad academic administration, that was Wisconsin. The dean, for some reason, really didn't like computer science. Um, he was a chemist, I guess maybe he spent too much time with punch cards or something, I can't tell. We hired one faculty member in the eight years I was there. Remember, this is the 1990s. There were a few things going on in the world. There were PCs, and then the internet became public when the NSF opened it up, and then there was this little thing called the World Wide Web, and we hired one faculty member. Not a good thing. Finally, an another real interesting takeaway is that you shouldn't publish faculty salaries. You know, when uh, the web came, Wisconsin state budget went online, and we were line items because we were state employees. So all of our salaries went online, and somebody found them. <laughs> Not a good thing. And there was a lot of discussion about whose salary was too high. Needless to say, everybody thought everybody else's salary was too high and theirs was too low. So after that, um, I went off to take a sabbatical at Microsoft Research. I was invited by the Lego group, which you've never heard of, because um, this was a secret project inside Microsoft. It was secret to everybody except the Lego Corporation, who somehow found out they were using the name and sent them a cease and desist letter. <laughs> and then they renamed it to BBT. Um, they wanted my expertise in, in uh, modifying binaries. I wanted some experience with industrial software development. Microsoft was the dominant player at the time in the software industry. And Microsoft Research started recruiting me as soon as I got there, needless to say. And Microsoft Research was an interesting beast. Uh, it was an industrial research lab, and you know there are relatively few of these labs. Uh, Bell Labs is the most famous, IBM Research, Xerox PARC, Microsoft Research, and I would put Google DeepMind in there as well. These are places where you combine pure and applied research. Uh, you have top-notch researchers who work on papers and publishing, as well as working on problems of interest to the corporation. For, unfortunately, it's really only feasible to run this kind of lab in a company that's a monopoly. You need a lot of spare money to be able to do it because it's a long-term thing, and companies think like next quarter, next year, not five years out, ten years out like researchers do. And so you really, if you look at these, these were all companies that had de facto or de jure uh, monopolies. But it was the best of both worlds. Great resources, you had a contact with the real world, but you also were close to academia. The disadvantage, of course, is you had a boss, unlike the faculty members who know perfectly well we don't have a boss. <laughs> um, why did I join Microsoft Research? Pretty easy. I was frustrated about the lack of impact of my UW research. Maybe I just wasn't patient enough. Um, I wanted to improve real software development. And you know, frankly, at that time, there was just no real software to do research on. This was before open source really took off. The programs we had, there were a few of them that were open source, that were sizable, but most of them weren't. And the, what was produced by industry looked very different than what academics did. There were no postdocs in universities at the time. There was very few staff. And as I mentioned, the university administration was pretty indifferent to computer science. Also, more positively, uh, you know, Microsoft Research was an incredibly exciting place at the time. You know, the best time to join an organization was when it was getting going. You know, it's super exciting when something is starting and things are growing very fast, you're hiring people and there's nothing that's set in stone. You can make lots of changes and you can have a lot of impact there. And also the weather was better in Seattle than <laughs> Wisconsin. Um, this was my group at uh, Microsoft Research, the Software Productivity uh, Tools Group. Um, this picture was done by the guy in the coffee cup, Rustin Leno. Um, and it was really an amazing group of researchers. If you look and sort of you know who they are, you'll realize that these are the people who really revived um, software tools and verification. The, them plus the interns we had are pretty much the big names in the field. It had been a, 
a, a active field in the 70s. It went down in the 80s because of the lack of impact. We brought it back up. Um, we wrote a tool called the Static Driver Verifier, which Microsoft shipped as a product to dri uh, driver writers, and it had a tremendous impact in improving the quality of device drivers, thereby improving the Windows operating system. And it was the first non-trivial verification tool that was ever shipped by a company. It had tremendous impact both on the company but also on the research community. We were able to shift the focus of the programming languages and the formal methods community to software tools away from hardware verification, away from compiler research. And it was really sort of fairly easy to do once we had a success. We gave some grants, some internships. We got some good people working on some very hard problems. Um, you know, thinking back, what Microsoft really should have paid me for is stopping them from doing something stupid. They never do that in a company, right? They never pay you even for successes, but certainly not for, for sort of not, things not happening. So, you know, around 2003, Intel finally introduced a multi-core parallel processor, and this is only 20 years after Spur. And Microsoft was like, what do we do with this parallel machine? We don't have any parallel software. And they thought, well, we'll write a parallelizing compiler for C++. And so somehow I got dragged into it. And I stopped them from doing it. And I consider this a huge success because this would have consumed tens or hundreds of millions of dollars and been a failure. Um, Instead, we ended up doing a collaboration with, one of my, with a former UW student who was at Intel, Ravi Rajwa, on a technique called transactional memory, which I wrote a book about. And you know, Microsoft and Intel raced ahead of the research community. And unfortunately, they got ahead of the research community because after about four years, five years worth of research, it was pretty clear that transactional memory wasn't a great idea. And at that point, Microsoft and Intel were so heavily invested that Intel actually ended up shipping uh, chips with transactional memory in it, much to their subsequent dismay. Um, I, after a bunch of the things like this and management, I decided to go back to technical work with this guy, Galen Hunt. Um, it was just one of these fortuitous coincidences. He and I were talking at a Friday afternoon wind down about the state of software, and we decided we would do something about it. So we started a project to redo an operating system to make it more robust, easier to verify. And we wrote it in the safe, managed language, C Sharp. Um, we improved the system architecture in a number of ways, very innovative ways. And it turned out that it was a success. I mean, certainly in the academic community, people still know of it, read the papers and talk about it. Um, and Microsoft actually started a follow-on project to build a product out of it called Midori. It, like most projects in a company, was canceled, unfortunately. Uh, the developers who were working on it never wrote anything down. And so the sort of two or three great SOSP papers that would have come out of it never got written. Um, and you know, just as an aside, uh, I still think that we need to go back and rethink the computer architecture and the systems that we build. We're still using the architectures, programming languages, and systems that were designed in the 1960s when computers were really constrained by resources. And you know, we should not be doing that. We have had a huge amount of improvement. We have many, many more resources. We need to use them to improve uh, the security and the reliability of the machines we use. And this is the kind of research that universities should and can do because it's long-term research. It's beyond the horizon of a company, and companies don't really want to be that disruptive. So that's a side. The last thing I did is I, at Microsoft is I start, uh, started working on cloud computing. Um, the CTO started an advanced research development group on cloud computing, and I became the director of research. We had two successes. We're actually pretty big successes. One was a software platform called Orleans, which got picked up by Xbox and is still distributed by Microsoft as an open source product. And the other one is Catapult, which was a hardware accelerator for the Bing search engine. And that got uh, deployed in Bing and made a 
a considerable difference in the performance of it, but also started Microsoft on a path of using FPGAs and building accelerators and started the industry on a path of looking at accelerators for data centers. And it was really, you know, both cases, it was very lucky uh, things. You know, Xbox, one of their devs knew one of our devs and they asked what they were doing and when they heard about Orleans, they said, ah, oh, that's something we could use. And they ended up using it, just fortuitously. And it turned out the Bing search engine was just perfectly structured to be translated and implemented in FPGAs. It was parallel. It was very uh, fine-grained parallel, and we were able to build an accelerator that worked. So, you know, one of the things I learned from Microsoft Research, and one of the things I keep on trying to tell people here, is that CS is far broader than computer science departments. Microsoft Research had 400 researchers in Seattle, and they really spanned the spectrum. There were a lot of people who didn't have CS backgrounds who were doing computer science. And it was a very sort of broad, diverse uh, perspective on the field, which I think computer science departments really need to incorporate into the future. Um, also, I ran, uh, came away sort of very impressed with developers. You know, they're as capable as researchers, they just have very different incentive structures than us. Finally, you know, sort of trite things, um, nothing is forever, Microsoft Research has changed, it's not what it used to be, that's not surprising. Um, and management really matters, particularly when you're in the middle of it. <laughs> so, how did I end up here? Well, one day, uh, the previous dean, Willie Zwanepoel, called me up and said, I see he's looking for a new dean. Are you interested? And I turned to my wife, who wasn't there, and said, you want to move to Switzerland? <laughs> and she said, uh, where <laughs> in Switzerland? I said, oh, the French-speaking part. It's only five miles from France. And I didn't mention there was a lake in between the two. <laughs> um, but. You know, my youngest son was headed to the university and it was a good time for us to move. And, you know, Patrick Abershire, fortunately, was the president at the time and hired me. And, you know, if you think about it, he's pretty much the only person in Europe who would have hired me. Um, I was an American. I didn't speak French. As Ed told you, I still don't really speak French. Um, I didn't speak German and I don't speak German. And I'd been in the industry for 17 years. And this is not the profile of an academic in Europe. And EPFL, you know, had the sense of excitement and unlimited potential that was um, true at Microsoft as well. And so it was a good time to come. Also, you know, the faculty were, were really strong. I knew a number of the people uh, and respected them quite a bit. There was very generous support from the university. And there was a large role. The deans had real tremendous autonomy and responsibility for the schools. Um, you know, you basically got a budget and that's pretty much what you started from. Um, I see clearly could improve. It was very focused on traditional areas. There were no big high impact projects and the students graduated and didn't go off to sort of top notch uh, university jobs. Not, none of this is, is terrible. It's what you expect from new schools. And then of course Switzerland was extremely appealing. So I took the job, I came, and I started getting all sorts of advice. And I'm trying to remember, I, I didn't put any names on it, but you know, I got advice to you know, collaborate with this, hire Professor X. You know, it's an existential crisis for Switzerland if IC doesn't do something related to data science or ML or security or, or a long list of other things. Um, but you know, the universities can't hire ML researchers because we don't pay enough and the companies are paying ridiculous salaries. And you can't hire junior people to come to Europe because they want to stay in the United States, so hire senior people who want to return to Europe. You know, in the end, what I concluded is everybody is very happy to spend your money for you. <laughs> what did we do? Um, well, we did sort of fairly obvious things. We hired junior faculty because the stable state for a department is about 20% if you look at it. And we had two junior faculty members when I came, which was far less than 20%. We hired heavily in machine learning. Um, 
we hired fewer data scientists than we had been asked to do because uh, I thought that the Swiss Data Science Center was actually a much more appropriate response to the emergence of data science than hiring a lot of data scientists as professors. I thought machine learning was more fundamental and uh, likely to be there uh, for a long time. We grew the security and privacy and theory groups because those are sort of important core areas where we had real strengths and we needed to build on that. And we started hiring in new areas. We you know, grew out the department in a bunch of different directions and started master's programs and centers uh, to correspond to our strengths. You know, culturally, uh, one of the things is to try to sh I tried to do was to shift the culture. Um, to this notion of a shared management. It wasn't just the dean running the school, it was the dean and the faculty, because it was the faculty's school. So I made the finances transparent so everybody knew sort of where the money came from and went. Um, when the associate dean for education and the heads of the committees led their areas, they really had autonomy. I didn't go and micromanage people and tell them how to do their job. I encouraged discussion. I got rid of uh, some outside committees, which ended up really just being crutches for people to do what the dean wanted done. And then we uh, mutualized and shared resources. We uh, built an IC cluster, which turned out to be a fantastic resource for people to do computer science. We shared the dotation, the money that comes into the department so that people who had uh, extra money could share it with the people who didn't have enough money, which were typically the new faculty. And you've already seen this picture. Uh, there's a few more of the people on this version of the picture. And I think it was 19, not 18 uh, new hires. But yeah, really, this is my legacy. These are the people who will be around and make the reputation of the department. And I'm sort of very happy there. And I grew the school. I mean, all of you who've been around have seen this graph in one form or another for a long time. I've been sort of plugging away in, at this, trying to sort of argue that we should grow. Um, and we got up to 50, which was my goal. I kept on saying we need to get to 50. Um, I think I was probably too modest, so I'm going to come back and say we really should be 60. <laughs> 50 is not enough. The field is growing. There's sort of a lot of areas, a lot of excitement, a lot of potential, and the number of students are coming in are going. So 60 is the new 50. Okay, <laughs> I see the administration looking kind of uncomfortable there, but uh, I can do this because I'm retiring. Um, and I had great colleagues, and notice that we did a re when we do retreats here, we also do them in the mountains, um, and you know we have a great time going into the mountains. So, you know, I made the decision to come here uh, ten years ago. And it's certainly a decision that I don't regret, and I know that Diana doesn't regret it either. We've had a great time here in Switzerland. So let me uh, just go and thank a few people. Uh, I won't get everybody, but I'll try to get them, as many as possible. So Dean's office. <laughs> there are a lot of people uh, who have been in the Dean's office who have done a fantastic job of keeping the school running and keeping it running properly and efficiently and making sure that the staff and the students are all properly helped out and serviced and sort of everybody is in the right place and doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so I was very fortunate to have some excellent people working for, uh, in the dean's office and um, you know, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Uh, I also had two assistants, uh, Tanya and Maggie, who have been uh, invaluable. I obviously could not have done the job without either of them. They both have sort of helped me uh, sort of maintain my life and sanity and get to the right places at the right time and talk to people and make sure that I get my bills paid and all the other things that assistants do here. <laughs> um, there's also the faculty, and I'm not going to go down and sort of thank them all individually, unfortunately. Um, but let me just call out three of them, which um, coincidentally, uh, two of them have already spoken, so I get to respond, I guess. Um, you know, on the left is George Candia, who for many years ran the faculty recruiting and made a tremendous difference at the cost of doing... A, unbelievable amount of work, you know, 
The reason we hired so many great people is that we did a great recruiting and we spent a tremendous amount of effort both recruiting and then convincing the people to come. And George was the person who drove this and I thank you very much because I would not be able to have such a great legacy without all your hard work. Ed, you know, I like to joke, Ed is the utility infielder of IC, probably EPFL. Those of you who don't know what it is, it's the person who can play any position in the baseball team. <laughs> you know, Ed can design a IC cluster and run HR. I don't really know anybody else who has that range of skills. <laughs> um, and then uh, Carmela uh, started the digital contact tracing project, which I was fortunate to be part of, you know, during the really dark days of COVID. We were doing something that really mattered, which turned out to save thousands or tens of thousands of lives throughout the world. And I'm super proud that we were able to do that. And, you know, I had a lot of fun participating in that project as well. If you can say fun about any aspect of COVID, that would be the only one. Finally, uh, I'd like to thank my students, my PhD students on the top row and my postdocs in the bottom row. Uh, been great, uh, you know, uh, researchers. Um, I only wish that I'd been able to give you a little more time when I was dean. Uh, I apologize for sort of slighting you on that side, but I think you all have done extraordinarily good work and I'm very proud of uh, being part of it as well. Um, fellow deans, I, you know, those are the people I started with and those are the people I ended with in terms of the deans. And were, um, it was a real pleasure working with them. And it's a very collegial um, set of deans. We were never uh, sort of battling like it was a zero-sum uh, game, which I hear from lots of colleagues at other universities. You know, we really sort of helped each other and it made... Uh, the experience of becoming a dean uh, much, much more pleasant. And then there were uh, two and a half administrations, shall we say. Uh, there was the original one under Patrick, and then there was Martin's first term with uh, two um, vice presidents, and then the second version of it with Jan as the provost. And, you know, I think uh, they all excellent administrations. It was I didn't necessarily agree with everything, and they certainly didn't agree with me on everything, but you know, we had a good working relationship, and I think the, the university is being well run. And then, of course, let me thank my family. <laughs> uh, my three sons, uh, my daughter-in-law, my grandson, and of course my wife, who is here today, and then uh, my parents, who are still alive and hopefully online watching this uh, today. My father was a professor, so that's probably why I'm a professor as well. Um, so, okay, let me just wrap up then. A um, couple of things, just some of the closing thoughts. I've done a bunch of things. I've done, I've taken a bunch of jobs that are quite different from my previous job. Uh, one of the things you quickly realize is you never know enough when you start something. Um, you know, you, you go into it and you learn by doing and you make mistakes when you're doing that. And that's just part of it. And, you know, if you don't want to make mistakes, then this is not um, the career path that you should follow. <laughs> Um, but you've got to start with a clear vision and a clear set of beliefs. Uh, you know, you've got to know where you think you're going. And you also have to be realistic to know that you can be wrong and that you're going to have to adapt your vision uh, to the reality of the situation. And I think that that's extraordinarily important as well. Finally, you know, I think you should always write the first or the last paper on a subject because everything between is just details. Um, and then... The last bit of wisdom is what I've told people in reviews for the last, for my entire career since I started at Microsoft. Tell me where you're going in 10 years and then tell me what you're doing next year. And if the two are not connected, and you'd be surprised how often they're not connected, there's something wrong there. And so you really need the long-term vision as well as the short-term execution to be successful. And finally, you know, 
you can take away from it whatever you want from my experience, but I think you know collaborators matter. And this is not just students, but these are your peers that you work with, your colleagues, people like Ed here uh, that I've worked with, people like Galen at Microsoft that I work with. These are extraordinarily important people. Um, you know, sometimes luck's better than brains. You know, it's great to be smart, but you need the luck to actually sometimes make the connections and make things work. So you need both. Never take a job without a goal. If you don't know why you're taking a job, probably shouldn't take it. And always do new things. Um, you know, I can't imagine a life where you didn't sort of have new challenges and new opportunities. And so let me just close by saying thank you to IC. It's been a real pleasure to be part of the school and to have an opportunity to work with all of you. All right, good. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we'll do this in English, as I said, probably for uh, Jim's sake. And um, <laughs> how long have you been in, in Switzerland? Nine years, 10 years? <laughs> so, um, good. Uh, so, I'm going to give a few notes here, but I'm, as a joke goes, I'm between you and the apero, so I won't be too long. But I need to set the record straight. Um, you know, everybody pointed out you hired 40 percent, 19 faculty members uh, in INC. What you guys didn't say is that you fired me, right? <laughs> because I used to be a faculty in INC. <laughs> well. <laughs> um, so somebody said you had the second largest office. That sort of implied I had the largest one, which is not true. The largest office on campus is Jim Laris or ex Jim Laris's office. It's now Rudy's office, right? No? Which dean has the largest office? It's not a dean, it's our, it's Corinne, it's in uh, It's what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> EPFL administration figures out what. Okay, good. Um, I'm really sorry I didn't put on a tie because last time I came to an IC event was 65 years uh, anniversary of Martin Odersky and I was invited to say a few words. I showed up in suit and tie and everybody else was in shorts and, and short sleeves, right? So I looked totally ridiculous. So this morning, you know, I, I had a tie. I said, no, 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 it's not possible. I took off my tie. So I apologize to Jim and Diana, no tie uh, today. Somebody pointed out that, you know, administration had some, uh, you know, was not a, always perfect at EPFL. I want to point out that Affaire Professoral, APR, okay, it's actually one representative is here. I saw Hassan Sadegi somewhere. Uh, yes, here he is. So you see the honorary lecture of Jim Larus is within 15 days of his birthday, 15th of September, happy birthday, a little bit late, uh, but we are very precise, right? I mean, the minute you pass 65, you're gone. <laughs> so um, you pointed out that it was a bad idea to publish salaries, uh, from what I understand, actually, INC is going to publish salaries as of next year, okay, because it's going to be full budget. But since we are in a communist country, we have all the same salary, so it's okay. <laughs> we can actually publish it, but um, I, when you mentioned this at Wisconsin, I was reminded, of course, of the California system where we are also state employees in the UC system, and so salaries are published and open. And this, conducted, this led to something very interesting, which is related to the current business, right? Which is the ranking business. So, and some of you know this story, but it's worth the 30 seconds it takes, which is um, when the salaries were published, a faculty member at UC San Diego, whose name starts with an H, uh, was very upset because he was not the best paid professor in the physics department, okay? And uh, so he went to see the chair of the physics department. He says, you know, it's impossible. Why am I not the best paid professor? You know, I'm the smartest, uh, well, most well-known, etc. What I do is the most important thing. So on. the chairman said, well, prove it to me, right? So this particular professor invented the H factor, right? To prove to his chairman that he needed a salary rise, right? And now the entire world lives by the age factor. This is a true story, right? Uh, because I have a friend in the physics department at UC San Diego. Anyway, so bad idea to publish salaries. 
indeed. And with this, let me go to the formal part here. I'll be very brief because we heard many of these things. That's assuming we can actually... All right, good. We heard all... Well, we heard partly this because thank you very much, Jim, for your lecture. So you're a Harvard graduate, number one ranked university in the world for the last... 275 years, roughly. Uh, that's quite an achievement. We're not quite there yet, uh, but thanks to your hard work, uh, I think we are getting there. And uh, from there on, our path sort of crossed. Not exactly, because I think you graduated just before I joined Berkeley, uh, 1989. And uh, you brought something from Berkeley, which I'm still hoping to really implement full fully at EPFL, which is its theme spirit and the fact of doing collaborative research. To some extent, we do it at EPFL, but we could do much more of it. And I would like to thank you for having brought this spirit here uh, to EPFL. Uh, your advisor is a very famous fellow. We heard him, Dave Patterson. He was very famous when I was there. He's you know, even more famous. And his co-author of a famous book is Hennessy, right? Who used to be the, uh, the president of Stanford. Uh, and involved with Google and so on, right? Now, Lisp, you worked on Lisp, right? Now, in the French-speaking world, so I'm going to use a few words in French, Lisp has a bad reputation because it stands for langage idiot saturé de parenthèse. So, you didn't know that one, so... <laughs> All right. Um, so much for... Uh, Berkeley, but you know, I still regret Berkeley. I'm sure you still regret Berkeley. Uh, it's, it's just an amazing place uh, from which we still can learn a lot. Then you went on to be a professor at uh, Wisconsin Madison. Now, the only thing, I've never gone to Wisconsin, okay? My loss. Uh, the only thing I know is that there is a very large Swiss expat community. I don't know if you know it but there are actually milk farmers, so... Uh, <laughs> but that might be why you came to Switzerland, ultimately, to find the real milk farmers. Um, you went on to Microsoft. That's a, an unusual move, but after, you know, you told us that the dean was a chemist, and uh, in eight years they hired a single professor during a boom time, right, in CS. I, of course, understand. And I also understand your uh, comment about having impact, especially in a field, uh, software engineering, where, uh, you know, a lot of impact is done through industrial research. Now, you said this one, I've never gone to Wisconsin, so I cannot verify this. You said weather is better in Seattle. Now, what I remember from Seattle is a T-shirt. The T-shirt says annual rain festival, June to May. Okay. So I don't know how it is in Wisconsin. Maybe it's, you know, hailstorms from, from June to May. Um, so, well, interesting. It's a beautiful city, but indeed, uh, I still believe the weather here is actually better. Okay, from there... You moved on, and I learned that your predecessor hired you. So I, I, I take note, right, because my job is up, up for, uh, for grabs currently, so I'll do like Willy, right? I'll call up somebody, hey, you know, you want to have the third largest office on campus. Um, good. So, but um, the truth is that, uh, you know, here we have the documentation and the numbers that, you know, Jim came and I had to leave, right? I mean, because I was actually very briefly dean uh, of INC, but I have to say I was very happy that you took over because I'm not a computer scientist, so what was I doing in that second largest office? Um, and you did, you did eight years of deanship, thank you very much, and four of them um, in, in overlap with our current administration. And in particular, during a critical year with 2020, the COVID year was very, very difficult. Uh, it's an obvious statement. And I have to say, it was, uh, it was very nice to work with you, count on you, your involvement in Swiss COVID and so on. And uh, so really, it was a pleasure. And you know, your fellow deans, I'm sure, agree. But also, uh, my colleagues in the administration uh, were very happy to work with you in a very constructive way. You would always ask you know, the pointed questions, but you would ask them, maybe you could tell Rudy how to do that one. 
<laughs> okay, inside joke. <laughs> but I think a few people know what I mean about. <laughs> Sorry, Rudy. <laughs> I owe you a beer, another one. Um, good. So where am I here? Um, okay, achievements as Dean. I, I wrote a few more here. So some have been mentioned, you know, you single-handedly doubled the number of students in INC, right? You went out to kindergarten all the way to high schools. Uh, amazing. Um, under your deanship, two new masters were launched in data science, super important, and cyber, uh, cyber security, just as important. You single-handedly moved us 20 ranks in the QS world ranking, whatever the QS is, right? Um, and, and probably, you know, we, we dropped a few in the Shanghai, but, you know, we compensated with, uh, with the Times Higher Education. You know, all of this will, you know, average out somehow to make this computer science department the best in Europe and ultimately in the world. In research, you were very much involved in the Swiss Data Science Center, which is probably, I have to say, the, the biggest uh, change in, that's, that's the upper level, in the structure of the ETH domain. Of course, uh, our common friend uh, Ed Bunion is very much involved in this. The Center for Digital Trust, I saw the academic director walking in uh, and the executive di director of trust here. That's another success story of a center that works extremely well, serves society at large uh, and, and while doing interesting work. Uh, the Center for Intelligent Systems, potentially a new center for artificial intelligence, all of this it was driven by INC. Now, <clears throat> the IC cluster was mentioned, I think, again, it's something amazing because IC cluster was done specifically for INC, but then it was given, it's a gift to EPFL as a whole, and is a model on how to run computing at an academic institution. I will serve as a model, I'm sure, uh, beyond EPFL. You also created a bank, right, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yes, so Jim Larris created a bank, not Credit Suisse, fortunately, but IC Bank. Uh, now, of course, now I take my other hat, right? So in Central, we are sort of worried about these little banks, uh, but I understand, because I still have a lab, you know, the usefulness of the IC Bank, of course. And uh, the other thing was mentioned by several of the Interventions, um, your leadership of ACM communications is super important because I think each community needs a flagship journal and AC, ACM communications is definitely uh, the flagship journal. And, and thank you very much for doing it and continuing doing it, super important. So with this, um, I can say you enter a well-deserved, I didn't know it was uh, second retirement, so I don't know what you'll do after the third retirement. Uh, but um, uh, Of course, it's very well deserved. You have achieved many things. We heard many of these things. I want to finish with just a couple of things. One is that sometimes I need to... I have actually a T-shirt uh, like this, which I had to wear when I was uh, temporary dean in INC because some of our colleagues, even after many years in Switzerland, actually have not yet noticed that they are in Switzerland. Okay, and so I have this little T-shirt who sortez du secteur américain, you know, because after all we are a public institution, but we happen to be a Swiss public institution. Well, Jim has not been one of them. Not that he learned French, okay, uh, <laughs> but he learned all the rest of the culture and the fun and the hiking and the wine and so on. And and in particular, uh, his wife Diana uh, does speak French and has helped, you know, this accurate duration of Jim in the Swiss uh, landscape, in particular the French-speaking Swiss landscape. I have also said that you guys are staying, right? Uh, at least for a while. I thought you would buy a condo in Florida, uh, <laughs> play golf, <laughs> vote for, you know, you know whom, etc. No, okay. <laughs> So, so we are very glad. Well, Berkeley guys, impossible, right? So, <laughs> I, I think it's a true sign uh, that, despite the fact that you don't speak French, you have become Swiss Roman. Okay, good. So, I, I want to finish on uh, maybe something more serious here. Uh, 
I would like to thank Jim for everything you have done for EPFL, not just for INC, but for EPFL. As a dean, as a professor, you have done great hirings. It was mentioned many times. Um, you have helped in difficult times. You have always been very collaborative. It has always been a pleasure uh, to uh, work with you. Uh, and you had this art of being very much to the point, but also very diplomatic, okay? Explaining to administrations that we were a bunch of clowns, but with a, with a smile, okay? And you know, for a while, I had another IC professor in my team, Ed Bunion. So, you know, I could sort of say, well, why don't you talk to Ed? You know, he also understands you. You know, I'm sort of too far away. Um, now, of course, I have a colleague who is an information theorist, uh, so I, I can also, you know, try to escape. Uh, but um, it, it was really a pleasure to work with you as a dean, and I wish you and Diane and your extended family all the best for this next phase of your career. Thank you very much, Jim. <laughs> and, so, okay, there is a formal thing, you get the diploma, and actually supposed to read, oh, I'm supposed to read the dedication, but it's in French, so APR, APR, don't you know that he doesn't speak French? Okay, so, <laughs> I'll read it for you. We can use chat GPT uh, in a moment. Alors, l'école polytechnique fédérale de Lausanne, décerne le titre de professeur honoraire à Monsieur professeur Jim Larus en témoignage de reconnaissance pour ses contributions scientifiques exceptionnelles et ses résultats admirables dans les domaines des langages de programmation, des méthodes formelles et des architectures et systèmes à grande échelle. Son engagement pour le PFL en tant que doyen, l'accent sur la diversité et l'équité dans les recrutements et le soutien donné à l'ensemble de la faculté et en particulier aux professeurs assistants engagés. Son engagement pour la communauté informatique dans plusieurs comités de pilotage de l'ACM en tant qu'éditeur en chef de Communication of the ACM. Thank you very much, Jim. We'll take a formal picture, maybe with the dean. Jim is the new 